Hey everyone, this is Norm Ferrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the Amazon FBA and e-commerce podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how to find your winning Amazon product. We're also going to be talking about the methods that are working today and what are not working today, some of the mistakes people are doing during their product discovery phase, and how do you know if a product will be profitable? All right, guys, welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the Amazon FBA and e-commerce podcast. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Okay, like I said, we're going to have a great show today talking about how to find your winning Amazon product. Our guest today is the co-founder and CEO of Voltage Digital Marketing. He's a returning guest. He has, he's been launching, operating, and growing private label uh, e-commerce business for the last nine years. And as of today, he and his clients have sold over 100 million plus in physical products, primarily through Amazon FBA sales channel. And today I'm going to be talking to Neil Twa. All right. But before we do that, we'll have a word from our sponsor. The Legion is your go-to community where you can learn, grow, and build your Amazon and e-commerce business. As you know, being an entrepreneur can be lonely. Now you can share struggles, build a network, and celebrate your successes. And guess what? Our community is free. All you have to do is head over to our Facebook group to join. You can also watch us on our YouTube channel at Private Label Legion so you can stay up to date with tips, strategies, and advice from other experts in the industry. Okay, remember one thing. To get all this great information, follow us, subscribe, and ring that bell so you can get automatic notifications. Okay, let's bring in the boy. Hello, happy Monday. How are you? Good, good. You never called mom yesterday. That is not true. We literally saw you. We FaceTime. That's that's what we did actually. Oh, so okay, okay. That's technically you're right, but yes, <laughs> of course. Happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful mothers out there in the world. Uh, we've got some beardos joining us right now. Welcome, Rad. Welcome, Cool Hand, and welcome, Facebook user. It's great to see everyone. Let us know how your weekend was. I know here in Toronto, it was sunny and beautiful. Um, yeah, the cherry blossoms are out. So it's, uh, yeah, very nice weekend. Are you talking you about the weekend. Lowry cherry blossoms, the chocolate covered ones? I love that no. time of year. <laughs> it Just is a good saying. time of year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what all are right. You so do? actually. I'm going to say we've got a big, big giveaway at the end of the show where you've got a giveaway from our guests, but also we have another giveaway and we're going to be announcing the Mexico Trip Scholarship winner. So we've got a couple, a couple entries and uh, we're going to be, yeah, doing the big wheel of Kelsey for an Perfect. extra school or uh, the scholarship for the uh, Mexico Trip. So um, anyways, I will drop the link in if there's any last minute people that want to get in on that. And for Neil's giveaway too today, we'll put in all the information um, for the Wheel of Kelsey. And uh, yeah, smash those like buttons. Give us a thumbs up. If you are not part of the group, go over to Facebook or in the Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA and e-commerce collective. That's where all the fun stuff happens. And yeah, if you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Hit that button below and uh, give us a follow. We'd really appreciate it. And I think okay. that's it. Very good, Kels. All right. Like Kelsey was saying, if you have a comment or a question, throw it over in the comment section. We'll do our best to get to them. Uh, I think it's a great topic today, so I'm expecting that there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, all right. Sit back, relax, enjoy a cup of coffee, and let's bring in Neil. Hey, Kelsey. hey, Mr. TWA. <laughs> Frequent flyer. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny. We were just talking about um, just error, like uh, our hatred about traveling <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. And your last name's TWA. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. Yep. Not, not to be confused with Trans World Airlines. Although no, you, no, no. Although if you do Google me, that's they're, they're all you're going to find is me and them. <laughs> Okay, so we had you on. We had a really great uh, turnout 
for that last uh, show that you did. Um, so we wanted to bring you back and just talk about a different you know topic or just kind of elaborate on on sure. what you were talking about the last time. Yeah. So right now, you know, I'm getting this question a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, how are things different? today than they were a year ago, you know, regarding finding a product. Yeah. Well, I mean, in my personal opinion, it hasn't changed. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of scuttlebutt in the market right now about Amazon's quarterly earnings hits and some of the things we're watching in the marketplace. But um, I literally just got texted by one of my folks yesterday who just had a record sales day, uh, you know, over 8,000 in sales yesterday alone on his product um, brand that he launched less than eight months ago. Uh, so he's pretty happy. So he's not really following the, the, the herd thoughts about what Amazon and his business is doing, because one way or another, after 10 years of this, I can tell you they're going to survive changes, uh, what changes those are. Uh, and just last week, again, I had another uh, guy text me named Daniel, who had just broken 9,000 a day in sales uh, in less than 12 months on his company. So, you know, it really gets down to, um, yeah, the market's adapting, the market shifts, they always do. If you're right. in the daily aspect and the trenches, you know that's going to be part of this, the, the roadmap of operating on e-com. Uh, Amazon FBA, no different than direct-to-consumer in terms of changes in market awareness and having that audience conversation with folks and, and ensuring the viability of your products. So in a lot of ways, it hasn't changed. I think just every year we get focused more on what's sort of shifting uh, in the trends of market types of products and movement. And by trends, I don't mean fidget spinners uh, and the latest silicon spatula. Uh, I mean products that are trending into what we call the blue sky evergreen space. Um, so it means, you know, staying in focused on what the core, you know, benefits and solutions that customers are looking for. And for a lot of things, that doesn't change every year. Uh, it really doesn't. I mean, staples and people in a lot of ways are pretty simple um, and what they want to buy and purchase. And, and every year it doesn't change that dramatically, even though some new things are introduced to the market. So, you know, to be clear, my perspective is it's not too different than it was last year, uh, as long as you're focused on the right, you know, activities of business. You know, I, I just came back from a mastermind. I'm whacked. Uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> Brain shot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Tons of learning. But, you know, the big topic. Mm. And it was uh, like two weeks ago in Orlando, then this week, uh, you know, where I just came back from, uh, it's all about external traffic. Mm. And the word that I've, I, I keep hearing, and I, I preached this a little while ago, but traditional marketing, you know, it was all shiny object, shiny object, new hack, new hack, shiny object. Let's focus on just doing some traditional marketing. And making your listings look half decent yes, and just, you know, go back to the basics and that will help a ton. Yes. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but. Uh... Well, I mean, in simple terms, if you don't understand the fundamentals of why your business is working well, uh, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong and what you can improve, no amount of external traffic or other marketing activities will solve those problems. Right. Uh, in short order, we discussed this a little bit last week in terms of optimizing to the fundamentals uh, of what the heck do I even sell and is it profitable and how to how to evaluate that correctly in the market the last time you know you and I spoke about this. But at the end of the day, if my listing is not metrically approved on Amazon or meeting its criteria, and I don't mean just green seller help account, I mean the metrics behind the metrics, uh, then you can put any amount of external traffic you want down and that is not going to solve your solution. It feels very reminiscent of 2016, 27 to me, Norm, because this was a big deal back then. And, and mm -hmm. even I talked about, you know, the value of social media signals then and becoming a very big influencer on the brand marketing space, because I've been a big proponent of talking about this for quite a long time, that brand driven brands are the only way to go. Uh, not just building products on Amazon, but building a brand in which the first market is Amazon for products. And then you move direct to consumer as you get clarification uh, and get more specific with your avatar. And then having that audience and conversation in the in the DTC world or direct to consumer world and even shifting them to Amazon or to your Shopify or funnel uh, based on their buyer um, perspective. So it really gets down to making sure we understand the fundamentals are still the core value uh, of what you need to do from brand traffic listings and et cetera, before you even work on external traffic. Um, and I say these things because I don't have a course or some other thing to sell you about external traffic. I think so many times when we hear this and we go to these events and stuff, it's really about what to be sold next on what next greatest thing in marketing and business. You always layer things on, right? There's layers to everything. You got to be the window washer operator first. Then you need to understand what it means to actually be an owner operator. And then you need to actually understand what it means to be the CEO. And I see a lot of business fail in five, six, eight months because they don't understand these levels of business. And they're trying to jump to CEO and hire people 
to fix and do all of these things, even though they don't even understand what they're going to be doing. And an example of that recently is one of our clients who was like, well, at this point, you need to just fire the agency you paid $3,000 to get you a converting listing. While they did a little better than your original listing, you don't even understand what they did. The first thing you need to do is go understand the fundamentals of what they even did to your listing or what you should be doing so that you know whether or not that was a good price or a bad price uh, for the results in the ROI you would have gotten off of that. Otherwise, you could probably make some of those changes yourself and see pretty dramatic impacts. Um, and as I was telling Kelsey before we got out, out of the gate here in the green room, uh, one of the people who listened to this show the last time I was on doubled the conversion rates of their listing just by listening to the free information we gave them on the show. So again, I think there's a lot of core components of the model people skip over um, mm -hmm. and they don't really learn how to operate them correctly. I, I don't know if I asked you this before, but I, I ask a lot of our guests. A few years ago, it was all about Amazon. Are you looking at omni-channel or are you focusing more on still just an Amazon launch or Amazon platform? So to start, we focus on the Amazon FBA channel because it fixes one of the biggest problems most new sellers or even moderately to novice experienced sellers face. And that is ensuring they get the right eyeballs on their offer. Mm -hmm. Really, it always gets down to the right amount of traffic with the right amount of conversions. Amazon has already split tested their funnel 1200 times in the last year. They already know exactly the buying points and data points, and they have solved a traffic problem for you, which is one of the biggest things most businesses fail at, which is getting the right amount of sales to keep their business sustainable and, of course, making it profitable so the business engine runs, right? So we focus on that channel first to understand the brand, understand the avatar, understand the buying signals, understand the price points, etc., and then we move them into a direct to consumer channel. I know there's a lot of pontification out here about multi channel segments within Amazon itself, other marketplaces, et cetera, but that's always over uh, simplified in the complicated aspect of delivering to each of those channels. If you sell enough on AmazonFBA.com, the main channel that literally makes up all of the other sales combined uh, across all the other marketplaces, they will help you move into those other marketplaces. So when the time comes, they will literally help pick up your business and move it without you having to do a lot of the legwork to get into those other channels. Okay, it becomes a lot easier. So we move to, to direct consumer after the FBA.com has developed our brand. And, and for us, that's past seven figures, uh, maintaining at least a 15% at margin once we've achieved those results in you know, eight, 12 months, whatever it takes. Uh, then we will move a direct to consumer and we'll start having that audience and conversation out here and then moving it back. We can even start that process to be very clear um, on you know social media backwards to our FBA channel once we see maturity and brand. The two examples I just gave you about the two gentlemen who are breaking eight and nine thousand dollars a day in less than twelve months on both of their accounts, they haven't done any social media marketing yet. They haven't even focused on any external traffics yet. They will go multi-channel, but they'll take the profits from where they are. And now they'll know exactly what they need to deliver from a message, a advertising, et cetera. And then they'll be able to get in front of the right people because I'll help them. Uh, to actually deliver their DTC channel out into the to the larger universe um, of sales. So that's my process. And we this to stay focused. Um, right. That the phrase in the country here is you you can't ride two uh, horses with one ass. So we're going to pick one store. Um, we're going to ride it and ride it until it's successful and then move to the next multi-channel. Okay, very good. Yeah, one of the things too that I, I find tough is you might have somebody that's selling $5,000 a day, $2,000 a day. They're seeing sales. And then convincing that person, if they need it, to move over to a social media uh, channel or to start writing some content or, you know, just trying to build up that authority some way or another. Yep. Because sometimes it just doesn't make sense. You know, oh, I spend another, you know, $2,500 on social media or on SEO or on, you know, whatever it, could, it might take. Social media content building takes a long time. It does. It's it's not an overnight thing. So yeah. unless they're prepared to see that, because sometimes you will get the you know people calling us and saying, oh well, we didn't you know, you know we we spent X number of dollars on a press release, didn't see any results. Well, yeah, you won't. It's it's a press release. You know, it, it might give you um, some links back to Amazon, but it's a press release. You're trying to build long term authority equals trust equals sales you know, when, when, when you're launching a product. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that even though you're establishing these sales does not mean that you should be all of a sudden starting to throw away your money, unless that is a long-term play, you know? Yeah. yeah you've got to have a process. You got to understand a strategy. There are a lot of tactics that can be deployed in the social media realm. And that's where it gets confusing for people. 
you know, which, which social channel should I focus on? What kind of video? How long is the video? What do I put in the video? Who does the video? Do I do the video? I mean, suddenly you're asking about 50,000 questions uh, in the details of social media that most people um, don't even know what to ask yet. And then as they start down the process, all of a sudden they realize, well, there's a concerted effort uh, in terms of time. And as we've discussed in the past, you know, time, activities, and money are how I address any business process as we should in business. And time is obviously the one commodity I cannot return in any other varying degree. I can't buy more. I only get what I get. And at some point I'm done. So right. my activities are most important to ensuring my time is used purposefully. I don't want to mask activity as productivity. And a lot of social media engagement channels and stuff can do that. They can create this. Are they necessary? Should they be used at some point? Yes, as I explained. When and how and to what varying degree, you're going to have to kind of make sure you are uh, smart about how you navigate that, smart about how you do that, and which particular channels are most important. And pay attention to the trends. Like just as an example, right now, Reels, uh, which is kind of a, a code word for, you know, all social media signal uh, 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 videos above or below seven to nine seconds, mm -hmm. <laughs> literally, um, are like, you know, Facebook and TikTok and YouTube shorts and all of these reels. You can take a one to many content blast. Uh, and just as one activity, um, I have a healthcare brand we're going to be developing. And in the process of waiting for the rest of the details of that to come out, I have my VA start a health related account on, on TikTok, just as an example. I had to start posting information three to four times a day. There's not even a link in the profile. It's just health related and, and awareness. And I wanted to start curating that audience. Uh, and so she's been posting three to four times a day. You know, we got past 7,000 people in uh, seven days, literally organically attached to my TikTok account. Why? Hyper-focused. We understood the audience and we started talking to the audience on little short seven to nine second videos um, that were created and uploaded every day. And now organically that traffic is growing uh, into obviously the thousands of users. And from there, we'll start to then curate them into the products that we're going to be selling. So an activity of that has started tactically. Uh, and those same TikTok videos will then eventually get produced um, into the Facebook Reels and YouTube and Shorts as I establish each one of those, layering them on top of the other. I don't try to do them all at once. Mm -hmm. We will layer them up and eventually we will see that uh, because we're, we're obviously honing in an audience, having a conversation, and we're going to turn them into buyers later on. Very good. Now, I know at the beginning you were saying that there wasn't a lot of things that you're doing differently, uh, finding products. Correct. But is there anything that you can think of that you are doing a bit differently in 2022? Well, I mean, the rise of TikTok, I hate to focus on it a little bit because it will sound very, oh, I don't know, latest marketing lingo. lingo. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But, but look, it is what it is. They've overtaken traffic to, uh, from Google's domain. They've become a major influencer in the e-com space due to the way that they uh, have set up their system to be very e-com friendly. Uh, and there's a lot of signals from that social traffic that benefit Amazon's algo. So as we look at those products and we look at that activity, that has changed. And this changed in another way in terms of product research. If you look into TikTok and you, you know, this, these uh, hashtag trends, um, you know, that I bought it on TikTok or TikTok made me buy it, uh, uh, trends have taken off and, and got a lot of viral traffic to them. Uh, because of that, you can dip into that. And we've dipped into it a couple of times and had a couple of our um, folks testing that out to good success by dipping into those videos and, and then pushing that traffic back to their Amazon listings with great results. Um, so that has become a little bit of a, a new thing this year, um, just because it's turned into, you know, follow where the social trends are happening in that space. And there's plenty of product ideas that are literally setting in front of you. How would you even evaluate that norm? Well, we just looked at the amount of traffic on each video, the amount of millions of views for each of the products. And then we just re reversed the engineered the product uh, to look at where it was and how much it was and whether or not it fit into our criteria of product selling, um, our green light spreadsheet. And if it did, great, we could look at la launching that product. And if not, how could we make it work if it was potentially a tripwire product into a brand or a new brand we wanted to develop? Or we just wrote it off as saying, you know, that's going to be the sub $30 product. No one's really, um, in terms of us, going to make it super profitable. We're going to move a lot of units for a dollar in profit, and we're not really interested in doing that. Uh, and so we moved on to the next product. So it became a little bit of an additional product research category in that way. Uh, and Reels across the board um, are sending out a lot of e-commerce products now. And so those are a lot of uh, data to be gathered. I just happen to like the way TikTok is now showing the data in the back end right. of those products and the ads themselves, where you can literally see the e-commerce ads of your competitors. And that's been, you know, things that uh, a lot of media channels haven't given up. Um, but TikTok is actually showing it to us, which is pretty cool, at least for now, until they yeah. make us pay for it later. <laughs> they will. They will. Most likely. <laughs> Most likely at some point, but there's a lot of organic uh, and relative. So some of those ad tactics have changed, but the strategies, and I think that was part of your core question. Have a, have a good component of our strategy changed in the last year? Not really, but we've adapted tactics. 
um, mm-hmm. to kind of move with the market. It's still, you know, fine products that are of a reasonable retail range. And of course, they have to be more profitable than retail uh, specific in terms of price points. They just need to meet criteria of profitability, most importantly. All right. Let's talk about mistakes. What are some yeah. mistakes that sellers are making right now? So, I mean, we've covered in simple terms, I think it's just, again, masking activities as productivities. The end result is what I call revenue generating activities. You should only focus on those activities, you know, or directly believe will impact the revenue of the business. Um, if you do not feel they are activities that will currently uh, or in short order uh, impact that, then what activities are you doing at this point that will impact that? From our perspective, it's finding additional products that meet our profitability criteria and getting them launched. It's ensuring, uh, number two, the listing quality and brand quality of that product is excellent, uh, that it meets in, or exceeds 20% in con- uh, unit session percentage conversion rates, both on desktop and mobile, uh, and that we have the ability, number three, to ensure that our A cost and TA cost is going to be at a point where we can then buy up and destroy the traffic in three, six, nine months that's in there for our competitors. Uh, as those are related directly to each other listings, people want to address their A costs, but then they don't really address the core problem, which is their listing. Uh, and then the fourth thing, which really shouldn't be at the bottom, it's not necessarily an order of most important, but just creating a really great product. Uh, and by a great product, I don't mean something that's just got the wow factor mm-hmm. in it, but it actually is a core functionally great product it feels good it's strong it has great packaging it, it is not just nice in its presentation but it is actually a great product that someone's going to be impressed when they purchase from us yeah i i know i was talking to afalavi um my partner in honu and he was showing me some of the product innovations uh that he was doing yeah and he started showing me these cad drawings and these 3d models and sure i'm sitting there going holy brain fart <laughs> These are absolutely <laughs> incredible. And all yeah. he does, uh, for the most part, is he takes an existing product and he just amps it up. Mm. And it, yeah. it, it could be right. just changing the material or he could be making it bigger or just adding something that's absolutely obvious. Yeah, and I mean, that's- listen, that's, that's all that uh, Instapot did. Like for its greatest glory, Instapot is just a glorified crockpot. Yes. They, they didn't yeah. reinvent the wheel. They right. innovated a slight differentiation and gave you the best be- benefit bullet points of this product compared to your grandma's crock pot. So if you're a lady of the you know this generation or a man who loves to cook in 2022, you gotta have an Instapot. Well, where did it go after that? Wait, what's the next step? Air fryers. So now we're in the generation of air. Now, Instapot didn't disappear. They're a billion dollar brand. Mm-hmm. The air fryer has now innovated against the bullet points of the Instapot, which then was against the Crock-Pot. So again, there's an evolution. I think people like to overcomplicate these things, and I just do my best to try to simplify them. Um, and basic, you know, in the sticks hicks from Ozark here, because I try to keep things pretty simple. And I think people want to overcomplicate a lot of the aspects of this selling market. And instead, I want them to just look back at themselves, go back into their own order history, look at the products they bought and the solutions that they were trying to achieve with those products and why they bought the $20 one versus the 60 or why they went for the 199 one when there was a $99 option. And really look at those products and say, what was the difference? And then it's not rocket science to innovate against the market when Amazon produces all of the data for you right in front of you. The trick is to make sure that you disseminate uh, all the nonsense from the real things you should actually look at uh, and the data and type of things you should actually focus on so you can go to market in that competition. But the beauty of this and in, in its simplicity is there's a similarity and a familiarity within Amazon's system that we love um, that builds that trust relationship, which is the core component of a, ni- a no like and trust relationship you must establish in the mind with that customer. Um, they've already built one of the most critical components of that in the, in the, the system in the Amazon being what I call the add to cart uh, of the e-commerce world has got that trust factor already down. So you need to know, you need to work on the know and like aspect of your product and brand. And then so many things really are rather simplistic in that way. Yeah, there's complexities to the market. I'm not going to say there's not, you know, there is. Uh, Amazon can be a bit of a bear sometimes and can be Mm -hmm. kind of frustrating to work around in terms of a business as we use their platform, you know, so therefore we have to uh, come under some of their things. We have to deal with some of the nonsense. Um, But frankly, every business is that if my friends who run DTC and deal with Facebook are screaming because Facebook costs are uh, bad or they shut down your account. So everybody has troubles in everything. And that's just business, isn't it? 
That's right. And that's one reason why you can't be a one-legged stool. Yes, you cannot be a one-legged. Not ultimately. No, you must move multi-channel. And that's, and to be clear that we are both in agreement, you have to have a multi-channel solution. And it's been stated that way for a long time, at least from my perspective. I mm -hmm. have said this for a long time. Uh, and I mean, years and years and years. Um, you must always open another channel. Right. Um, just opening another Amazon account in another uh, country uh, in another marketplace is not considered, in my opinion, multi-channel. Um, if you open another leg uh, into, say, Wayfair or Walmart or somewhere else when the time comes and it's right to do so, now you're becoming multi-channel. When you open a Shopify or a funnel for your products to move direct to consumer, now you're becoming multi-channel. And why do why do I say that? Because as the brokering M&A side of this business model, we're looking at the operations. We're looking at the operation independencies. We're looking at the upside potential of the brand. We're looking at the multi-channel for the brand. And so as we're defining what is a good business to purchase, uh, on this end of the house, and I know that the you know Amazon aggregators are doing it because they consult with some of them consult with us, so I know exactly what they're doing. But you know, with that twelve billion deployed last year into purchasing these, if you're going to have an opportunity to really scale and, and make this a, a good purchase, you need to look at those other uh, activities, those other critical data points, like we do, uh, to determine that multi-channel actually has a value to your company. It's just not more marketplaces. I will be very frank about that, right? Okay, so for the listeners. If you're launching a product or if you have plans on launching a product, are you doing anything different this year? Anything that we haven't talked about? Yeah. You know, I, I'd be curious to sure. you know, hear I'll tell from you a them. Strategy. Yeah. I just taught my group this a few weeks ago and we've already had some great success coming out of the test from, from other users in our mm -hmm. group, uh, students who are, who are executing it. There's this little instant page form uh, because people have a lot of questions about lead forms and what traffic forms and all this stuff. And remember, I'm a pretty keep it simple, stupid kind of marketing guy. Like I'm a lazy marketer and it's worst uh, explanation because I'm looking for the fastest results to fail. And from that data, then I want to know how to adapt so I can win. So I'm fine with failing as many times as needed so I can understand what I can do to succeed. And one of the things I won't do is get into all the technical mechanical mumbo jumbo about, you know, what click funnels versus drop funnels or, you know, should I start a Shopify store or is it WooCommerce? Like that's all technical crap. At the end of the day, if you don't have a conversation in the audience, your customers don't necessarily care which button they push. When they want your product, they will push whatever button they can to get your right. product. So mechanics aside, uh, the aspect of developing this little thing had to do with how do I keep people within an ecosystem, Facebook or Instagram or even TikTok, where they can converse with me in its simplest form, do it with the way that the platform wants me to do it, and then have that no like and trust relationship that turns them into a buyer. Uh, a simple little strategy was the lead generation forms uh, called instant pages inside of TikTok. Um, those are created, you can run ads against them and within TikTok's interface within their mobile app, people will click, hit that instant page, give you their email and information, and then click over to your website page link or Amazon listing or wherever you plan to send them. It's not terribly complex. It's built into their system. They love it. And when done correctly, you can get really cheap leads interested in your product. Now I say interested because at this point you're just having an audience and a conversation with them. You're not trying to sell them. People want to sell so fast. They forget that. They want to buy. They don't want to be sold. You're the same way. I'm the same way. Don't forget that your customers are the same way. I think so many people in business are just like sell, sell, sell and forget to have that conversation. You just can't do that. So this little tick is really the lead gen uh, campaign uh, objective within TikTok. Uh, it has to be run on ads. Um, you can't run it specifically with just organic traffic. But that strategy has done very well for building a list, which is very important for your customer. Having a conversation with them and then selling them the product through your list or mechanisms where you know uh, most people don't understand. I think you know this eight to nine times a customer needs to touch your business in some capacity, some form before they'll actually purchase. It's about eight to nine times. So you need to be thinking about how do I have that conversation with somebody? How do I share more value? How do I touch them You know, eight to nine times in the process of getting them to believe uh, that they can buy this product? And you're like, well, why do I want to put that much effort into a person who's going to buy a $50 product from me. Well, because you're missing the point of the 120, you know, 150 million prime members now, if I remember correctly, uh, well over a hundred of them spend $1,000 a year on Amazon. All right. That's Amazon's 12 month CLTV customer lifetime value. I want that CLTV. So I am willing to put a system of simple conversation and topics and email in front of these people so that I can touch them eight to nine times. So they will feel confident enough spending a thousand dollars with my brand through Amazon in the next year. Those are my metrics. And if that makes sense, you understand where I'm going with the, with this. All right, very good. Okay, if you do have questions, I see there's already three. If you have okay, more awesome. questions, uh, just throw them into the comment session and we will be coming to them in a second. All right. uh, also, 
We have got two really great giveaways today. One is Niels. Niels, tell us what your giveaway is today. Well, the value, I think, of, of this, and it was already recognized by somebody the last time around, um, is to have a one hour with me. I'm going to go into your business if you're running right now. If you're looking at, like, how do I get started? I'll share some data. I've been shared products with people. Uh, they give them an understanding of where we're going. I'm going to give you an hour of my time. It's usually worth about 500 bucks if people want to consult with me. And so I'm going to give that away for you guys to just come on and spend an hour talking about your business. It's a discovery call. It's not a sales pitch. I'm not going to close you. It's not a hard whatever. Uh, just, you know, spend some time and let me see how I can help you get going down the right path or help you address anything that you've got critical in your business. Be happy to do that. Right. And the last, like you said, the last time somebody did this, I actually saw a message from them yes. on how fantastic that call was. Oh, fantastic. Good. I'm glad yeah. to hear that feedback. Yeah. So anyways, it'll be well worth it. So anybody who wants to enter that, it's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey, tag two people, and you'll get a second entry. And also, Kelsey, I don't know if you want to come on and talk about uh, the uh, the other giveaway that we're having today. All right. Yes. So today we are announcing the winner of the scholarship. So this is the $3,500 off usually an $8,000 ticket. So uh, this is to the Mexico sourcing trip. We've been running this promo now uh, for about a week now. So we've got all the scholarships. This is Lunch with Norm giving away this. This is on us. We're eating that $3,500 cost. And this is for the sourcing trip happening in June. So we're finally announcing it. We're announcing it today. So you got to get it in now. There's just a couple more minutes left of this draw. So um, get it in. I'll post the comment or post the link in the comment sections. Um, it's just an, a very easy form that you fill out your name, uh, your email address, and then which trip you want to be a part of. And that's it. So yep, can I get add, that in there. Can I can I have Voltage offer a $500 sponsorship on top of that? And let's make it 4000 for somebody who gets involved. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's what we can do. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Fantastic, Neil. Thank you. All Ooh. right. We just made it a $4,000 sponsor. There it is. Somebody wants to get on that. Okay. Fantastic. Right. Thank awesome. you. I had no idea. Thank nope. you. Well, all right. Enjoy. Now on top of that, yeah. Kelsey, I think we have to go to a sponsor. A big thank you to our sponsor, Startup Club, the largest club on Clubhouse with over 790,000 members and growing. They're one of the world's largest communities supporting the startup ecosystem from founders to those wishing to work for a startup and everything in between. You can find them at www.startup.club for blogs, recordings, and a calendar of upcoming shows and on the Clubhouse app. Just search Startup Club for daily shows 24-7. You can also now listen to their show, the Serial Entrepreneur Club podcast on Apple and Spotify too. Stop by to connect, learn, and grow together. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh, man, you just took me by a surprise. I really appreciate that. Uh, My pleasure. That 500 bucks. I really My pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, Let's talk about profitability. So when you're looking at a product nowadays, yeah. um, how do you know? Well, what are your thoughts about this product? You know, if it's going to be profitable or not? So in, in my evaluation, our process that we've developed, um, that's, I think, been one of the most critical components to our success in this market with e-com and, and the business building aspect of what we do um, is the profitability of understanding the product itself, not just from a retail, but the value or perceived value of that product. I've talked a lot about this in terms of it being solution oriented versus just emotional driven uh, or versus, um, you know, it, here's the thing when it gets down to it, right? Uh, people that are buying products typically less than $30 are going to have this sort of mindset in a lot of ways, not always, and I'm not generalizing to, to try to profile people, but in general, you profile based on avatar in business. And that's what we're doing here. And they typically have this idea that, well, okay, this better be a life changing product for $30. This better do this. It better make me cook faster, jump higher, run better, save more money or become a millionaire. And if it doesn't do that, then I have no interest. You know, I, this product is going to have no value to me, even if it is potentially a great product. So you get above that price point, you get into the $50 or $300 range, what you're actually finding is people are more interested in being like, okay, that's the product I want, I bought it. And then I take responsibility if it's not a great product because I know that was a lot of money to spend and therefore I you know, take a totally different perceived mindset of value to the product and the solution I'm solving. And they are very different kinds of people when they deal with the product, the customer, their experience, and the way they think and drive business. And those are typically those people who are willing to spend that $1,000 uh, or more a year 
on Amazon, they are typically driving higher price points of product affinity. Um, as we mentioned before, you called it low, medium, and high. I call it tier one, tier two, and tier three. Um, and again, it's pushing that difference in avatar. So at the end of the day, I typically want to work with products that are 50 plus dollars um, because they will not only meet the profitability requirements of, of our process uh, to pencil them in or account for them properly on the profit side. We also know that the competition is not necessarily playing in the same realm. We know that their customers could potentially be bought by us through a, a cost or other methods within Amazon's brands or sponsored brands or PPC. Uh, and or if we take activities of marketing and start paying for TikTok or advertising or reels or whatever, that there's budget in to do that because we've built that into the profit of each unit and we've actually tracked that metric correctly. So we know there's a good opportunity for that product and the bigger market has a lot of upside potential and it has a lot of brand perceived and high perceived value as a solution to the customers that are buying it. Okay. That was nice, quick, very concise. You're on this. <laughs> I think I know what I'm doing, Yeah, <laughs> but that's just me hanging out in the mountains, <laughs> screaming in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like what you're saying because just before I came on uh, this call, I had a, a client call and it was refreshing because it was a great quality product. Sure. They started at $750 and they went up to a, about $1,600 and it was, oh my gosh, there's profit built into this yeah, and lots of it. So if you, you need to spend a little bit more on PPC or brand awareness, there's no problems with that. They, they, um, they did not do prime, but they were doing FBM, but, uh, had no yeah. problem, no bearing. They had a really yeah. great listing and yeah. they were just wondering what I thought. And I said, yeah, they were, you know, they were bang on. Uh, they checked all the boxes. They looked really, you know, it looked like a great listing, but what caught my eye was that price point. Well, it's that mindset again, that if, if I can't necessarily afford it, or I wouldn't necessarily spend that kind of money right now, even if I could, it's the idea that nobody else is doing it. Yeah. So we kind of put these little bit of blinders on and we kind of focus our mind and worldview towards that perspective, but not you know forgetting that if you actually go look at those price points on Amazon and you actually stop for just a second and maybe went today and searched on Amazon for products that are $750 or more in retail price point, guess what? You're going to find there are millions of those being sold every month, millions upon millions of them. And for $750 in retail price with your potential $250 in profit, let's say uh, at the very bottom line, um, how many sales a month does it take for you to actually make a decent income? It doesn't make thousands of units. It may take tens to hundreds. And all of a sudden you've got a product that's pulling into three, $4,000 a month in profit mm -hmm. on just one product, even if you're only moving 20 units a month of it. So again, the perception and value has to change. And that's what I'm here to make sure people understand. Yeah, exactly. All right. So once again, just kind of going over that method for finding products outside of being profitable, outside yes. of looking great, what are the other aspects of a great product opportunity that you find? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you from my own perspective, yeah. and then I'll tell you how I how we reverse that to, to try to create that same level of value perception in the customer's mind. And one of those main things is packaging. So many people skimp on the quality mm. and production of the packaging. And what you may not have noticed is we did this test and we, we put it into our group. We went out and ordered 15 products across Amazon and we brought all those packages back and we took pictures of each of the packaging and we looked at the different branding and whether or not the brand actually matched with the packaging from the listing. And you'd be surprised how many times the branding and the product and the packaging looked so great. And when it showed up, it was on a crappy little box inside of Amazon's box that you couldn't even identify was the product you even purchased until you got all the way through the packing material. So I think that's a very bad value statement of perception to the customer. When I see them, you know, I call it the iPhone experience. And I know this may have been talked about before, maybe even on this podcast, but there's a very different perception of the weight and quality and value of an iPhone product you spent 999 bucks on most likely mm -hmm. uh, when it shows up and you unpackage it and it looks like one of those Russian dolls, you're kind of pulling all the pieces apart as you get <laughs> to this thing. But everything is sort of an experience as you do that. And the anticipation is growing as you're unleveling this product. Um, we want to create that perception of value. So great product packaging has a high perceived value of the product that's within it. What you don't want to do, of course, is have them get to the end of this iPhone package and up pops this plastic piece of trap that was hidden inside of this great packaging. All right, you need to have that whole thing flow through. And I think people do not take enough time and in some cases, maybe not choosing the products with the right amount of profitability. So they can't afford to create that experience. And I'm telling you, it's a huge component. Think about it yourself. When you open these types of products and packages, how do you feel about them? You can probably say from the last 10 packages in Amazon, just emotionally from this conversation, you might be able to tell me how you feel about it. 
and which ones you felt good about and which ones you were like, nah, that wasn't so great. Should have a good product. I'm kind of happy with the product, but you know, if I really stopped and think about it, there wasn't that much impression uh, for me in the packaging. Especially if it's recurring. You know, if you've got something like a beauty product that every day, every 30 days you have to buy it, that customer experience, those microseconds, by the time you get the package, open it up, yeah. you know, do you have a customer or are they just going to say, okay, this is just another product? Well, we've had people comment on reviews just about the packaging. Beautiful. <laughs> That's how I know that yeah. it's working well. Uh, just the perception of value from the price point they paid uh, is a perception that they're going to buy and most likely have bought additional products from us. Right. And, and they'll really they'll part it. with a few extra points too. They will part with quite a bit more. Yeah. That they perceive. I mean, okay, who was it the other day? Was it Kylie Jenner or somebody who got caught with the uh, $19 makeup kit off of uh, Alibaba who she, that she was selling for $369? like don't do that like she yeah. may have sold a lot but and ultimately that's burned her for any future product and it has already been proven to be true um so the end result is again maybe spend the hundred dollars but sell it for 369 but make sure people go wow and don't get caught just selling cheap chinese crap that's such an easy and low way to move to the market and then it's a fast way to go out of business I, and i i want to like i i have a my dad i sent product to my dad and it was um it was a non-alcoholic spirit uh -huh, and I yep. said, here's all the competition. And he got it. And I said, now open them up and tell me which one and what you would pay for them. And yep. I said, the price ranges from around 24 to about 44. Uh -huh. Well, three came in bubble wrap and three <laughs> he saw, or thought were horrible. Like he, he didn't like it. He didn't like uh, well, one of them. He just didn't like the bottles, but the other had a, a really nice bottle. So they thought it was a little bit higher. But the one that was in a really beautiful box, that's the one, $40. Yeah. yeah. And it just turned out that that is the top rated product in this category. Mm -hmm. it, and they have a beautiful box. They, they've marketed it properly. So yeah. people can easily pay $40 compared to the $24 ones that have no packaging and they come in bubble wrap. <laughs> It, it has to do with, again, how do you enter the market and who's telling who to enter the market? Yeah. Like when we tell people to enter the market, our expectations are like, you're going to be prepared to go here um, because to get to there, you don't actually recognize, you know, at that level of Everest, um, here is what people have had to do to get there. And when we explain that, we explain how we did it, explain how they did it. Um, and, you know, everybody wants to achieve the Everest goal in their business, whether it's time, energy, money, F, you know, family, whatever it is that that Everest looks like for them on the summit. Uh, many oftentimes they're being sold that, you know, you can buy your cheap Chinese oxygen bottle and wear the cheapest, you know, stuff you got from Walmart to go up Everest. I'm sorry, that's that's how you die on the mountain. <laughs> um, and, you know, that means you need to go to the war uh, with the right materials and efforts. And that is what it costs to go to that market. And if it's too soon for you to go, save some more money. But then go to battle correctly with the right armament or go up the mountain with the right gear, because I, there's a lot of dead bodies on Amazon Everest. Right. Very good. Okay. Here's a big question. Yes. Okay. Is there any way to guarantee a winning product? Is there any way? No, there's a way <laughs> to guarantee failure. There is absolutely no way to guarantee a product. Here's how I guarantee that I will find a winning product. You understand the difference in what I just said? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the guaranteed method that I know is to do what I call micro product investing or investing in micro amounts of products until I find a winner. The guaranteed winner is within those products. I just don't know it's a guaranteed winner until it says, hey, look, I'm a guaranteed winner. Like you cannot go to market with the expectation that the product is going to sell to all levels of Everest. That's the same way you can't guarantee that leaving base camp, you took all the oxygen you need 100%. So you always take a backup bottle, right? You always take one extra. And if you can't afford the extra one, don't leave, don't leave base camp until you have that extra bottle. Right. Okay. So at the end of this, the, the the simple answer is you have to make sure you get your ducks in a row. Um, if those are not correctly aligned, you will die on the mountain again. Sorry. Um, it's just the way that it works. So you have to test. We can know with 80% confidence in the data, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've got enough data to now say, go here, don't go here, do this, don't do that. That's our revenue generating activities. We know we'll produce a product. But we don't go into the market with one to two products heavily loaded with hundreds to thousands of units. We go in. Uh, in a, an investing strategy that many have deployed. My mentors taught me in the business world and I applied that to Amazon. That's what I've done. So the end result is I won't put 5 million into one company, but I will put a million dollars into five companies. 
and one of them will win and it will be a guaranteed winner inside of there. And I will discover what it is in the process. I won't discover it just because I came up with the idea and because it hypothetically looked profitable in Jungle Scout. Right. Okay, very good. Kelsey, I think we could start taking some questions. Fire. Well, that wasn't the question. We got more? Oh, uh, we got more. Oh. All right, bring it on. <laughs> All right, let's see. From Cat Daddy. Sure. Uh, how can I protect my listing? One of my listings changed by other sellers uh, every time. I guess the yep. main image, it looks like. So if, if that is occurring, then this is a brand defense in its simple terminology. Uh, and what brand defense means is your ducks are not quite in a row for you to to be able to defend your listing or ensure that Amazon knows it's 100% you, your brand, your product, your listing. In simple terms, people understand this is brand registry. We also understand this is a business uh, that is completely structured for sale on Amazon only. And then, of course, brand trademark uh, or even patent pending, which doesn't mean you have to go through the whole patent process, but patent pending can be a process in which you use for brand defense. Uh, if a, people are able to go in and change it, there's obviously a couple of reasons this could happen. Even in, in a nefarious setting, someone on the back end of Amazon could make that change uh, or give access to a seller that would allow that to occur. We've seen that happen before, but that's probably the more outlier than the actuality of questioning uh, and not without uh, uh, you know making any assumptions, uh, cat daddy, <laughs> um, that you have not or have done all your brand defense mechanisms necessary to ensure that that could not occur. Uh, so the best way to protect your listing is to protect your business. Uh, and ensure all your business ducks in a row. And then should Amazon or something occur, your defense can actually move faster through the process of reconciling any issues. Okay, I, I've got something to add. Yes. Um, so Vanessa Hung was on the uh, podcast a little while ago, and she was talking about this. She brought up a concept that I wasn't too familiar with, but it's called contributors' rights. Mm -hmm. And this is by going, downloading your, um, your uh, uh, catalog file, and checking to make sure everything, all the fields are open. Um, but if you can constantly update, and she says that she'll do it on some listings once a day, but she'll do it once a week. Um, if you do it once a month, it's okay. But she does it as often as possible. And she uploads like changes to the listing. And then what Amazon sees is that you are the main contributor to the listing. And that will help block anybody that's coming in and trying to change your images on the listing. So hijacker. So just keep that in mind. The podcast uh, was the last Vanessa Hung podcast where she talks about contributors' rights. I had no idea that this existed. Well, we use it in terms of the flat file component of uploading in the system in which we have uh, Amazon triggers a different viewpoint of the listing in our experience uh, that the flat file upload has a different authority level. If we have flat file upload privileges to the listing, then they kind of de facto say, well, you've got to be the owner, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as we make those updates, updates through the flat file, that's literally being registered in the system. And so our updates don't have to occur that often. Uh, and the reason I would be cautious to warn, and I don't have nothing against the, Vanessa, I don't know her, and I didn't hear her last podcast. I would just say from my own experience, be careful what changes you make to the listing when you do these uploads. When you say changes, that's a big, broad, dangerous word in my mind mm -hmm. for people who are like, well, I'll change 10 different things on the listing, but they don't track it and they don't know what they changed. Um, so then they don't know whether it's positive or negative, how to get back. So just yeah. be very clear, yeah. make one little change, even just one little change in registering an upload. And make sure you know exactly what that change is, document it correctly. If it goes negative after that in the next 48 hours to 72 hours, re-upload the, the existing change, right? Just know what you did and know how to turn it back off because I've seen this happen too many times, too many changes, too many updates, yep. and you start getting negative aspects, you start getting negative USP, and then by the time you figure out what's going on, you've now created a whole negative environment. Again, nothing against the Vesa, Vanessa, I, I think she's on to something, no doubt. Uh, it's just the mechanisms we deploy to make sure we don't have to touch it very often or make mistakes. In that and moment. she actually talks about making sure that you take notes, small Fantastic. changes at a Perfect. time. Yeah, exactly like you're saying. Perfect. Okay, next question. Okay, next question is from Tony. Do you have any recommendations for a landing page? I have used uh, yep. Google Forms sometimes as, as a low cost option, but I wanted something uh, a little nicer. Well, I think it, this kind of goes back to what I covered maybe a few minutes ago in terms of like how I look at the mechanics of this thing and really want to get simple fails. So on the TikTok side, that's when I use their instant pages. On Facebook, you can use their uh, uploaded pages as well inside of their lead objective. 
um, to just send people to the internal aspects of their apps and inside of their system and then qualify them as a potential uh, customer in a relationship with you through email. So, you know, I'm not going to recommend one particular type of external solution because this can get into a whole lot of complexities and arguments about this and that and all these other things. Um, whatever is the simplest process that works for you isn't about how much better the mechanics work. It's about how much better you're speaking to the audience. Because remember, they will come for you if they want your product. They will push whatever button they want you to do. If you're in a no like, and trust relationship, and if you've established those things and Google Forms is the best way for them to touch you, then by all means, qualify it, quantify it. If it works, don't stop. Like one man's you know, car is not necessarily better than another man's when they both get you from point A to point B. That's just a perception of value change. And this is my point about arguing mechanics. Great. All, all right, right. Our next question is from Claudia. Everybody says to have an optimized listing, but how do you know when it is optimized? Again, I'm going to keep it simple, stupid, lazy marketer. When I make more sales, it's more optimized. Um, when I make less sales, it's less optimized. I know that sounds really silly, but at the end of the day, the, the real metric for qualification of an optimized listing is the unit session percentage. You need to understand the differences between desktop and mobile. You need to understand the differences of your last 30, 60, 90 days of optimization. And then you really need to understand what Amazon is seeing as considered a best practice for products. They move into the choice best sellers and top 100 badges. It has to do with whether or not you're performing better than the other competitors. The engine is literally taking care of all this automatically through its AI. OK, you did, you, there's no human interaction and in messing with that unless you get into their systems and somebody messes with it, <laughs> which can happen. Uh, but at the end of the line, it literally you need to understand their best practices to get to page one where 90 percent of all the revenue goes. OK. Uh, to be clear about what I'm saying here is where you need to be, where the money is. And in the top five listings, 20 to 30% of all sales go into the top 10 listings or above. Um, so to get to that page one and to compete with those products, you need to have more than a 20% unit session percentage rate on desktop. You need to have more than 25% on mobile. Those are minimums to get to the page, stick the page, and then make sure your ranking is, is staying in line with the competition. To get to the top, you got to get above 30%. I know that sounds weird for a lot of people and oh, I'm maybe on my side of this listing and competition, I'm, I'm only seeing 18% and I'm in the top 10, Neil. Great. You're in a less competitive niche than the ones I'm dealing with. When you're in a competition or high competition situation, these are the numbers I'm deploying. And why is that important for you to understand? Because that's where all the real money is being made on scale, right? You can make great money at those lower metrics and those lower positions in the system, but I no longer settle for that anymore. I settle for taking people into the top tiers, which means you need to have 20, 30, 40 plus percent conversion rates. You're going to own, you're going to dominate, you're going to take over page one. Um, so again, to be very clear on optimized listings, it is down to the unit session percentage for desktop and mobile. You need to meet the base requirements for what the algo considers to be a top seller. You've got to have more profitability than your customer and you've got to be ranked in those positions higher and stay there organically, not just because of your outside marketing or your A cost. When you stop those marketing campaigns and you start to derank, you are not optimized. Yeah, I don't think the optimization routine ever stops. No, no, it's, it's a constant testing. Yeah, yeah. But a constant measured testing. Two millimeter shifts sometimes I've seen. Right, I've right. I've moved the 15 unit a day sales to 50 unit plus a day in just one little two millimeter shift. So once you get down to that last little pit, the less you play with it, and this is a problem with mindsets in the entrepreneurial world because us ADHD people are like, constantly touch it, constantly change, constantly adapt. It's like, no, stop touching it. Slap your hand, do what you need. <laughs> Walk away from the computer. Don't touch the buttons. Like, um, you know, you gotta let this thing run and go slow, er. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, we have two more questions. Yep. Uh, this one is from Rafia. Uh, my client is going out of stock after a few weeks and uh, should I have to stop the PPC or should I have to decrease the bids? Any suggestions because I, I don't want to lose them ranking. All right. So let's think this through. And I literally think I just sort of just answered this to a degree, but let me get the nuance answer here and, and to bring this forward in the in what you just asked based on what it just said. If you are out of stock, the equivalency would be you have a low optimizing listing. If you're continuing to push hard on your A cost in PPC campaigns, but your product is not available, that is going to start stacking up negative metrics on your account. Um, that is going to be considered more of a, like a USP zero and you keep pushing that, you're going to derank your product by pushing that. You need to stop the PPC campaigns. Um, shut them off until you get product or if you can move your product into FBM until the FBA goes possible. We overkeep products in store at 3PLs above our FBA brand so that if an FBA brand goes down or something goes, we can immediately switch our FBA to FBM listing. 
and keep our rankings up there, even if we have to raise prices or do other uh, tactics that we use to keep that product in a ranking position so we don't get ranked because the difficulty of getting re-ranked uh, after the you know, the engine has initially penalized you because your unit procession percentages have dropped below and your rankings have dropped below, you got to have a hard push to get back up there and it's going to take a lot of time to do it. So I would suggest, again, to be clear, stop the PPC uh, and or switch to an FBM model if possible to keep that product in stock. Okay. Last question. All right, uh, last question. Before we get to that, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. And uh, all right, Tony, which is the best way to get on TikTok on a shoestring budget? Yeah, so if you were catching this a minute ago, Tony, um, we uh, brought up a new branded account in the health and wellness space. Uh, we were posting three to four times a day, totally organically, seven to nine second videos in there that had a little call to action and information. They were using some of the embedded text and a video and uh, excuse me, audio within uh, the app itself because you know, TikTok likes to see you using more of their, you know, captions and stickers and other things inside those videos. And three to four days we were posting, we had about 7,000 organic followers in seven days. That was totally free. Three to four, uh, I will, let me clarify that. It wasn't totally free. I paid my VA per an hour. It cost me about 80 bucks a week for her to do that. Um, so that portion wasn't free, but the traffic and organic growth was. And now I've got it set up so that I can actually start dropping links in there. I can start using those videos into marketing. Those that are producing the most, some of them took off and did like 25,000 to 50,000 views on just these little seven to nine second videos. Uh, some of them didn't do as well. And so with that testing, I now would know which videos most resonate with that audience and we're creating more of those videos. All right. Looks like another question snuck in. Sneak in. All right. All right. Is Amazon Live worth testing? This is from Howard. Well, again, here's the thing. Is it worth you testing for influencers or is it worth you doing Amazon Live? I would argue that for the business owner, it's not necessarily worth it for you to do Amazon Live, right? Uh, it may be worth it for you to get involved in an influencer who does Amazon Live, especially an influencer who is promoting products in your niche. The same way, it's probably not great for you to be the TikTok influencer who twerks all day long and tries to find the music social trends, but it might be best for you to get involved in a process in which you can uh, get people in front of those products or information on behalf of your business. Think like an owner, right? Not just an operator uh, when you want to grow these. So the answer to that is it's worth whatever you think it is to you. Right. Okay. Very good. I think that's it, Kels. Yep, that's right. Uh, thanks for the questions, everyone. And just to let everyone know, if you're new to the show, um, you can ask these questions every episode. Um, we kind of go through this Q&A session with our guests at the end of every episode. So uh, come back on Wednesday and we'll be back for some more Q&As. Okay. So let's get to the Wheel of Kelsey. Oh, I guess before we do that, uh, one last word from our sponsor. As you know, at Lunch with Norm, bigger is always better. Bigger business, bigger profits, and yes, bigger lunches. Z wants to make sure that your business and profits are bigger by taking you and your business international. They are a one-stop importer of record shop, including compliance and logistic services. They focus on all the elements involved in a smooth first time custom clearance so that you can focus on what you're good at selling. Click on the screen now or follow the link in the description box below and get 50% off your first shipment today. Okay, there we go. Now is it time for the wheel of Kelsey, sir? Mr. Kelsey, where are yes. you? All right, Will Kelsey, here we go. It's time for the Wheel of Kelsey. All right. Quite a few people. Wow. All right. Hey, I don't know where the heck Kelsey is. He's disappeared. <laughs> okay, so like Kelsey normally would say, make sure you. Oh, there he is. Where the heck? Was I don't know. I'm not sure what happened there, but anyways, uh, yes, congratulations, Steve F. If you are the or 
as you are the winner, uh, please email me k at lunchwithnorm.com and we'll uh, connect you with Neil and get you your prize. So congratulations, uh, Steve. And I'll put that over in the comment section too. And Neil, uh, before yes, we get to our um, giveaway, uh, people, if they want to contact you, how do they do that? Well, the simplest way is to just Google my name or, you know, whatever favorite search term, Neil Twal. You'll see my social media, LinkedIn. You'll see the website for voltagedm.com. Uh, encourage you to check out our information, our other podcasts, media, YouTube channel, et cetera, whatever's linked in this podcast. Um, I'm not too hard to find. It's just TWA. No, it's my last name. It's not an acronym. Uh, and you guys can find me pretty easy on the social webs out there. And uh, just feel free to reach out to me if you want to have a conversation. I wonder how many times people do ask you, is that your real last name? Well, I can tell you during the week, it's actually quite a bit. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it is a, it's a, Usually it's mistaken as sort of, a, you know, a PhD, MBA, some sort of, you know, type of title of Esquire or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, no, it really isn't my last name. I'm a tall guy with a short name. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get to the scholarship. All right. All right. So, yes, this we have a big one. Big scholarship. So this is for now $4,000 off a regular $8,000 ticket to the uh, trip. So here we go. We're going to shuffle these up and let's see who the winner is. We will follow up and let you know who is the winner. Look at... uh, oh. Uh, oh, wow. That was close. <laughs> All right, Catherine. Catherine. All right. Fantastic. All right. So we'll have to reach out to her if she's not listening. But uh, uh, anyways, yeah, congratulations. All right. Congratulations, Catherine. So, Kelsey, we just want to make sure, 100% sure, that she is going to be in Mexico. She's flying down. So we want to make sure that the person that wins this actually is going. So <laughs> You must get on the plane. You must get on the plane. <laughs> Anyways, Neil, yes, thank sir. you so much for coming on the show today. It was great. Love to have you back again at some point. But, oh, uh, yeah, time. you were awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate you both. And uh, getting to spend some time today talking about what I love to do in the world. Sell All products. Right. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Remember, just check out Neil. Like he gave you his contact information if you want to get a hold of him. And who was it that won today? Steve. We have Steve. Steve? Steve. Oh yeah, yeah, Steve. Mm -hmm. So you know, good luck, Steve. You're gonna have a great session with uh, with Neil. Okay. So thank you very much again, Neil. When we will talk to you soon. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. It's always great to, to have Neil on. He, he always delivers a ton of information. Anyways, uh, Kelsey, for the next episode on Wednesday, who do we have coming on? All right. So this is a first time guest, actually. So um, we're going to be talking a bit about customer uh, retention with uh, Shanif Danani. Okay. Um, so this is first time guest. Uh, we're going to be talking about how brands can increase their customer retention. Um, so it should be good. Um, and yeah, on Friday, I believe uh, you are flying out again. So we will have to do a pre-recorded episode. Yep. Um, but that is happening as well. So. Okay. No, I'm fr flying mm -hmm. out on Thursday, so I might be able to do it. Okay. Okay. So anyways, uh, if, we, if, if it isn't live, we'll get somebody uh, to come in and we'll have a pre-record for everybody. But until then... Now, Kelsey, am I going to fill in what you're supposed to do? Smash, like, I hammer, mean, if you'd like. You're ring. doing a great job right now. <laughs> All but, that uh, stuff yeah, you're supposed to do. <laughs> smash those like buttons. Uh, if you're watching from YouTube, make sure you hit that big red subscribe button down below and ring that bell. If you're watching from Facebook or LinkedIn, uh, make sure you give us a follow. And uh, yeah, you can also set your notifications if you hit the three little dots and press the push notification buttons. Um, that'll let you know when we go live every time so you don't get uh, you don't miss out on our lives. So uh, we hope you are enjoying the pre-recorded episodes. This is a way that we don't have to cancel the episodes outright. Um, it is getting a little busier now with the schedules, with uh, all these conferences and events happening. So uh, we're adapting. We're trying to do our best for it. So let us know if there's anything we can change. Um, I, I still think it. Snacks with Kelsey would be, you know. Snacks with Kelsey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll think about it. I think right. it's like growing on me a little bit. But um, okay. Yeah. 
it's great to see everyone. I saw that we had a bunch of new users as well. So thank you, everyone. Good luck to Claudia and the Calgary Flames tonight. We were talking about that in the comment sections. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. All right. So thank you for joining us today. And you can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. Like I always say, we could not do this without our community. We really, you know, appreciate and love you guys. Um, if you're not part of the community, please go over to the Facebook group and join. But uh, thank you and enjoy the day. Enjoy the rest of the week. Lunch with the, lunch with the, lunch.